So this is really uh, presenting a particular paper um, that um, we submit, uh, we presented at Coxi last year. So this is really uh, at the intersection of artificial and intelligence and cognitive science. It's a study uh, into active work learning through self-supervision. So we are modeling um, processes that also happen in human language learning, but we're modeling them using AI. Uh, and I work together uh, with Afra Ali Shahi, my supervisor at CSAI, and uh, Ali Reza Mahmoudi Kamalabat, who was a master's student at the time, uh, doing a research project with us, and is currently working on his PhD uh, in robot assisted language learning. Okay, so I wanted to open with this tweet with a quote from Jan Le Kuhn, uh, who says, long term progress in AI will come from programs that just watch videos all day and learn like a baby. Now, if you're a parent, I don't know what your opinions on this are, but um, this yielded a lot of joking responses uh, on Twitter, such as um, Jacob Eisenstein saying, as anyone who has spent even a minute or two with babies knows, um, they learn exclusively by putting random objects in their mouths. Now, of course, this is a joke, right? Um, um, but the, what I find quite interesting about this uh, response is that in the second case, the baby is not just watching videos, right? The baby is actively doing something, it's actively exploring their environment, right? So even though it's a joke, there is a, there is a, a grain of truth in there. Um, and this is kind of the, the type of uh, the, the idea that we are, we are modeling uh, in our research. So. In cognitive science, um, one of the areas that's studied a lot is um, uh, studying which words uh, map to which objects in the environment, right? So this is very important, of course, to be able to talk about uh, uh, things in the world is you need to know the correct label for objects. And one of the ways in which this is uh, often modeled is through cross-situational word learning. Um, there are many different implementations, but the uh, basic idea is always if you uh, look at a lot of occurrences of, uh, of objects and words in different situations, eventually you will be able to figure out which ones are, uh, are mapped to each other. Now, as I said, there are many different implementations and algorithms proposed for this, but they, they all have in common that typically they, the learner just happens upon language and visual input, right? So the learner just happens to see objects and get language input. Um, and what we're trying to do here is actually when you when you think about parents and their children, very often parents will will talk about objects that the child is already attended attending to. We know this from language acquisition studies that this is the case. Uh, parents are very very um, really try to follow their their child's attention. So we thought, okay, potentially children have the opportunity to to shape their own language input, right? So um, what if they do so? based on their current language knowledge, right? So what if they are particularly curious about objects that they don't really know the correct label for, for example, how does that shape learning? So that's the basic idea. So we try to, uh, try to see if selecting input according to some, some, uh, some measure of what your current language knowledge is, how that would, how that would shape the learning trajectory. So what is the task that we're, we're modeling? We're modeling um, basically a two-part task. So uh, one is uh, figuring out which object is the correct referent for a label, and the other is which is the correct label for, for, uh, for an object, right? So we have a comprehension task and a production task. Now, the thing about our model is that we have these two modules, but they can actually feed into each other. So if we have a comprehension, uh, the comprehension module sees a bunch of objects, here's a word, outputs, uh, uh, outputs the object that it, think is, it thinks is the most likely referent, then we can, again, feed this object to the production module, which outputs a label. And this is a sort of introspective quality of the model that we can use uh, both to train it in, in a self-supervised way and also to select input that is, uh, that is um, uh, relevant in the current state of knowledge. So let's see how this self-supervised learning goes. This is a toy example. In reality, we use realistic images, but um, basically we have scenes with a bunch of objects. So let's say there are three objects in this scene, a, a duck, a sun, and a tent. And we hear a word called duck. Uh, we hear the word duck. Then the comprehension module tries to match the, the find the correct object that goes with this label and says, okay, this, this second object, this, uh, this sun, that is probably the, um, the referent. It's wrong, right? But uh, it doesn't know that. Then we feed this object to the production module, which outputs a label. 
and produces a uh, with, uh, with outputs a label, right? So we have we put in this object and we output a label. Now, what can we? How can we use this for learning? Well, we just compare compare the input at the start to the output, right? So in this case, the input to the comprehension module does not match the output of the production module. Since this doesn't match, we need to we know that we made some mistake and we need to move away from this uh, from this matching. We don't really know where the mistake is, right? Either the comprehension module made a mistake or the production module, but in any case, uh, in its entirety, it didn't perform correctly. So to go a little bit more technical, for those of you who are familiar with, with how neural networks work, um, so uh, basically what we do is we have word embeddings that are random at the start, uh, and we concatenate them with a VGT representation for every object in the scene. So we do this once for every object in the scene, we output one value per um, per object. So basically we have kind of like an MLP, right? Um, and we do this once for every object in the scene. So we have as many output nodes as there are objects in the scene. We can do, uh, and we can interpret these as, as um, uh, the likelihood that this is a correct pairing of, uh, of an object and a word. Now, then what we can do is we can input uh, an object in the scene, again, represented as these VGG vectors, which are sort of like high level visual uh, features. And this production module outputs a distribution over the vocabulary. So in practice, what we use to train the model is, uh, is the cross entropy between this, this output distribution here and the one hot coding of the word that we input in the first thing. And we back propagate through this whole thing. And we can actually do that because we, yeah, OK, maybe I'm going into too many, many technical details. But um, the reason we, we can actually do that is that we don't, during training, we don't input just one object, but we input a weighted sum of all of the objects in the scene. So we treat these, uh, these values here as attention. OK, um, that's the technical part. So now, how do we use this two-part thing to also select input, right? Because that's the other part of this study. Now we sort of flip the modules. So what we do, because we want to know for each object in the scene, would it be helpful to receive the label at this point, right? Would it be helpful to, to receive a language input for this one? So we, for every object in the scene, we input the objects to the production module, which outputs the label. Then uh, we uh, feed this label together with all of the objects in the scene through to the comprehension module, which outputs an object again. And again, we can, we can see whether this matches or not. Now, how do we actually use that uh, to see if this would be helpful? Well, one of the things we can do is we can look at the mismatch. So basically, just uh, is this the same object here or not? Um, and that, that is what we call subjective novelty. So if, these two, if these, this mapping is very wrong, then subjective novelty will be very high, right? So it's basically the, the average absolute difference between the output nodes. Um, and then we have a second measure, which is called plasticity. And this is actually the highest for those items for which the learner is kind of like unsure. So it doesn't, it hasn't made up his mind very, very, um, very clearly. Um, for those of you who are familiar with how, how neural networks are trained, this is actually um, based on the, the um, the uh, gradient of the output uh, activation function, which means that if we do a single update for, for a model that has this kind of output, then that would actually bring a very big change in, in, the, um, in, the, uh, in the output representation, let's say. OK, so we have uh, a measure that says whether we are wrong, and we have a measure we, that says whether we expect to be wrong, right? That's the thing. And, and a measure that says whether we um, are, have made up our mind very clearly or not. And then we have curiosity, which is basically the product of the two. So it considers both these factors. And then we have another condition, which is random. So we just get one of the objects in the scene at random. That's the one that we get the label for. Let's see how these training results, uh, how these results compare. So first of all, what we see is curiosity, models trained in a curious condition are performing the best. They're performing better than models trained in a random condition. But this is not actually the case for plasticity and particularly for subjective novelty. So subjective novelty is really lagging behind, right? Um, and another thing that we can see is that the standard deviation, so this is, this is averaged over 20 runs, 
the standard deviation for most in the curious condition is the lowest, which means that most of the runs kind of converge to the same level, right? Whereas for the random condition, there's a bit more variation and for plasticity as well. Um, so these are comprehension results, production results. I don't want to go into deeply. We don't really have the time, I think, but it kind of shows the same pattern, but the numbers are lower. The reason is that we now have 4,000 category uh, candidate words to choose from rather than three objects at, on average, right? So it's a much more difficult task. That's one of the reasons, at least. Um, I wanted to show you these plots, which are the results after each epoch of training for all of the models that we trained. So we trained 20 models in every condition. These are, these are on training data after each epoch of training. Let's first look at the curious. Curious models, curious models are the, the um, orange ones. So as you can see, they are both have the highest accuracy in uh, training and, and on test data. And also uh, the, the, all of the lines are kind of like close together, right? So they kind of converge to this level quite robustly. So for, for the blue one, which is random, some of the lines kind of converge to similar levels, right? But it, this is not robustly the case. So some of these guys don't really end up at the same level. Um, and for the city, the picture is a little bit different, but it's kind of similar. And another thing to see is that um, even at the very, after the very first epoch of training, already uh, curiosity has a, sort of a leg up. Now you may wonder about subjective novelty, which is the odd one out, right? This, these green, bizarre green lines here, and they are performing exactly a baseline here. So what subjective novelty seems to be doing is it's very good for remembering your training data. It's not good at all for learning anything that generalizes. Um, okay, that was um, the results. So basically, curious exploration does help learning faster, more robust, more accurate, but subjective novelty and plasticity alone do not. Thank you. <laughs>